delay. The delay. The delay. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to How Happening and our Turo Vega project. Yes, that is our name. <laughs> um, it's not How Gallery. It's not happening. It's How Happening and our Turo Vega project. If this is your first time here, we're a nonprofit gallery um, that's dedicated to this neighborhood, past, present, and future. We do um, really active programming. We did 130 events last year, and they're all sort of related to the shows. This show is by a painter named Brent De Palma, who happens to be seated right there. Everybody give him a round. And one of the things we like to do is have the artists curate a series of programs. Um, so this is Brent's third night. We've, we've had a wonderful run, and we're so pleased to have Daniel and I am here for you tonight. Um, we're also, I'm gonna announce one last thing and then I'll shut up. We have a big party on Wednesday night to close out Brett's show with Ernie Brooks, the original founding bass player for the Modern Lovers. He'll, he has an ensemble called Bear 54. They do uh, songs from Arthur Russell's catalog. It's, it's really special. We're also, you, you, you may not want to go out there tonight, but we have a poetry jukebox in the alley here. You press a button and hear a poem. And on Wednesday, we are going to um, add our Christmas playlist. And we're gonna have cider and some wine, so feel free to come by. We've progr cr programmed it with cool Bowery sounds, so there's a little coded hit in there. Um, what the music will sound like. So, tonight we're celebrating um, Daniel Wolf's book, Grown Up Anger, and he will be accompanied by Chaim Tenenbaum, and everybody give a warm round of applause for this wonderful night.
which was, which was supposedly bequeathed to them forever. As you can imagine, it was not forever. Um, and when the treaty was adjusted, is the polite way to put it, there was a sort of land rush over the border. And Mr. Guthrie, Woody's father, um, was the son of a cowboy and sort of saw the future and said, they're not going to be cowboys forever here, and studied some accounting and some law and decided he was going to do better than that. And he became a real estate hustler, essentially. And he um, spoke a little of the five tribes, different languages, and he ended up, according to Woody, who exaggerated. One of the things Bob Dylan learned from Woody Guthrie is you don't have to tell the truth all the time. But, uh, Mr. Guthrie ended up with 30 farms, according to Woody. And it's why when people said Woody Guthrie is the original Oki, you know, the, the, the Steinbeckian guys who lost everything and ended up in California, Woody said, no, it's not me. My father had lots of money. And he did have lots of money until the big city essentially came to him. There was an oil boom, and real estate dealers smarter than he uh, came and took all his 30 farms away. He had other problems at home, um, all in Woody's first, uh, let me back up slightly. In those days, he was also a Democrat. In those days, the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln, was the party that believed in um, abolition and freedom for black people and maybe for Indians. Um, and he was a Democrat which was the Old South. And the white people who got to Oklahoma were Southerners who tended to be segregationists. So he ran on that platform and was a politician for a while. And Woody, sort of in the middle of his life, had to kind of think back and renounce his father. He always loved him, but he had to renounce the politics. But he grew up in that environment. And his family fortunes took, took a dive, partly because these city slickers got the farms, but also because his mom started behaving very strangely. And there were uh, three fires. The big house they built in town when they had all their farms mysteriously burned down. In Woody's autobiography, he talks vividly about being there. It was three years before he was born. We let that slide a little. Uh, his sister was burned badly uh, and eventually died of the burns. And then his mother and father were in a house at some point, and his father caught fire, is the way Woody put it, without talking about it too much. And that ended the family, to all intents and purposes. Woody Guthrie was 15. Um, and the mother went to an insane asylum. She had Huntington's <laughs> disease, Huntington's chorea, which is what Woody eventually died of. But no one knew what it was at the time, so they figured she was crazy. Uh, she was never blamed for any of these accidents, but it's what the town thought. And the father went out to Texas where he had a sister to feel better, to heal. Woody hung around for about a year, maybe more, as a kind of street rat, is how he described it. He didn't have any family. He lived in a little shack. Uh, it, this is before the Depression. This is 27. So it's two years before the fall. In fact, it's boom times, but not for him. Eventually, he goes out to Pampa, Texas, finds his father, who is running a whorehouse. And none of this story is part of the Woody Guthrie legend, as far as I know. Um, is running a whorehouse. And Woody settles into Pampa and starts playing cowboy music, Carter family music, Jimmy Rogers music, which is what's on the radio. He does it as a kind of part-time thing. He's also painting signs and telling fortunes to make money. And there's no money by now. The Depression has hit. He gets married. And in 1935, so he's 23, probably 22 or 23, a big dust storm comes through. 60-mile-an-hour uh, winds, all of the topsoil from the Midwest, essentially, up in the air and moving towards them. The sky turns black. And he writes his first memorable song about it, which the great Haim Tannenbaum is about to play. <laughs> I've sung this song, but I'll sing it again Of the place that I lived on the wild, windy plain In the month called April In the county called Gray Here's what all of the people there say So long, been 
good to know you so long. It's been good to know you so long. It's been good to know you. This dusty old dust is a getting my home, and I gotta be drifting along. The dust storm hit, and it hit like thunder. It dusted us over and covered us under. It blocked out the traffic and blocked out the sun. Straight for home, all the people did run, singing so long. It's been good to know ya so long. It's been good to know ya so long. It's been good to know ya. It's a long time since I've been home, and I gotta be drifting along. Talk to the world. Sorry, talk to the end. Sing a song, we'd sing it again. We'd sit for an hour and not say a word. And then these words would be heard. So long, it's been good to know you. So long, it's been good to know you. So long, it's been good to know you. It's a long. So let's switch from Woody to Bob Dylan. He's born in 1941, so he was born, what is that, 29 years later? 19, 29 years later, after Woody. He's born in Duluth, Minnesota, um, it, where he lives until he's six, and he goes to Hibbing. Duluth's small and a port town. Hibbing is smaller and an iron ore town. Um, it was a town so dependent on iron ore that they moved the center of town because the mine they dug undermined the town, and they had to move it south. Uh, his father, the reason they went to Hibbing was his father got polio. Uh, his father was second generation Jews from the Ukraine. His mother was maybe third generation, I think second generation also. Uh, he goes to Hibbing, which is a town of 16,000, I think, uh, and declining in population when he gets there. And his father runs an appliance store, or tries to. He's got polio so bad, the description uh, Dylan gives at one point is he had to crawl up the front stairs. Um, so again, a thing that you don't hear about Dylan, but he grows up with that sort of in his background. Um, he 
You know, I can't tell if he hated Hibbing or not, but he had the reaction of a kid in a small town, which is there's got to be something better out there. There's got to be something more exciting. And the way he sort of located it was through radio and movies. And the radio stuff, I mean, when he, later on when we get to know him as a folky, he swears he's only ever heard folk music. But you go back and actually see what he was doing, and he was listening not only to Hank Williams, but to Little Richard. And there's a girlfriend who said, he and I were the only people in town who knew Maybelline by Chuck Berry, and that's why we got together, because <laughs> they both knew it. And she also claims that he was so fascinated by African Americans that if a black person came to town, he'd go out of his way to meet him, even if the guy was, you know, a traveling salesman or the plumber or whatever. He, Bob Dylan wanted to meet him because here was a real black person in the middle of Minnesota. Um, so he's fascinated by that stuff. Um, and his, he, he plays rock and roll in a band through high school. And his high school yearbook, when they ask what he wants to be when he grows up, he says he wants to be in Little Richard's band, right? Um, and then at some point, um, he hears folk music. And the story changes 100 times because there's a chapter in this book that begins, Bob Dylan is a liar. Um, he says so, is the second sentence. And, and it's true. I mean, he just made it up as he went along. But at some point, he heard folk music, whether it was Odetta or the Kingston Trio. But the, the folk revival was starting to happen on the radio. And he thought, that's what I want to do. Part of me thinks he said, that's what, he, what I want to do, because it was what was happening. And he was a very ambitious. 17-year-old. Um, but I don't know, maybe he just loved it, too. He certainly did love it. Um, he goes down to the University of Minnesota for his, um, as an undergrad, and he lives in the Jewish fraternity. Um, he's eventually kicked out. Uh, I don't think for doing anything bad, but just because he never showed up. But he's living in the Jewish fraternity, not being the rebel that he loved from James Dean, for example, because he loved the movie. Um, and he, he's growing, if Woody Guthrie is growing up in the Depression, um, and his family's, Guthrie's family's down and outness is both personal and just what's going on in the country. A quarter of the country was unemployed uh, at the time. Uh, Dylan grows up in what's known as the golden age of capitalism. It's post-World War II. You know, Detroit has all these jobs. Minneapolis has all these jobs. The unions are strong and powerful. This is a vague memory to all of us now, but it happened. And he is kind of, the, the feeling is you can always get a job. You can make it. There, none of this gig economy. I look at my son who's sitting in the front row. None of this gig economy. <laughs> um, so he goes to the University of Minnesota. And at some point, again, it's not clear how, <coughs> excuse me, he discovers Woody Guthrie. And he falls deeply in love, and he wants to be Woody Guthrie. And he not only learns as many Woody Guthrie songs as he can, uh, including one Heim's going to play the little bit of in a second called The 1913 Massacre, which plays a big part in this book, and is not known to a lot of Woody Guthrie fans even today. He knew it back then. Uh, but he not only learns the songs, but he plays the guitar the same way, he holds it the same way, he smokes a cigarette the same way, he dresses the same way. His accent goes from middle-class Jewish in Hibbing to Oklahoma, whatever Woody Guthrie was putting on at the time, and he wants to be Woody Guthrie. Um, and he becomes a Woody Guthrie jukebox. And he decides after a year at the University of Minnesota that he's going to go to New York to find Woody Guthrie to find Woody Guthrie and because New York was where it was at if you wanted to be a folk singer. So it's, I think, a combination of those things. Um, when he gets to New York, he says, I hopped freight for three years in South Dakota and I was with the circus for a long time traveling when they ask who he is and my parents, you know, I'm an orphan. I didn't have any parents and all this stuff. Uh, but in fact, there's, a, there's, an, there's an article from the time in the newspapers, I mean, a little bit later when he gets a name where they interview his father, Abe, and his father says, you know, we gave him a year off college. And if, and if he could do all right, you know, he could stay in New York City, which they didn't think much of. And if he didn't, he had to come back and go to school. This rings many more bells to me <laughs> than hopping freight and so on. 
So he gets there, and he gets there in 1960, uh, January, early, and he, and he figures out where Woody Guthrie is, uh, which is in uh, a mental institution, because his Huntington's chorea disease has gotten bad by then. If you guys know what Huntington's is, it's the nerves all fire all the time. You can't control them. So your brain's fine, but everything else is out of your control. So Woody Guthrie not only couldn't play the guitar, but he couldn't uh, light his own cigarette and hold it anymore. And Bob Dylan shows up as a 19-year-old um, and says, OK, uh, you're my hero, and um, starts playing Woody Guthrie songs to Woody Guthrie. Starts being Woody Guthrie to Woody Guthrie, which I always thought was an amazing scene. Not because he ends up being Bob Dylan, although that's interesting. But I looked at it from Woody Guthrie's point of view, who is mentally fine, and is going, why is this kid doing me? <laughs> you know, and how exactly he's doing me. Anyway, um, Dylan gets there, and he's disappointed in a number of ways. One is that his hero is sick unto death. Um, and he writes about it a little. I'm going to quote. Um, but it changes his life, I think. This is a little poem he wrote. Woody Guthrie was my last idol. He was the last idol because he was the first idol I'd ever met face to face that taught me that men are men, shattering even himself as an idol. And it, I, it wasn't just Guthrie. The other thing, Dylan talked about he was creating his own depression. Here he is in the era of plenty, but the only authentic thing was being a Depression era musician. So he liked to think that was going on, and he liked to think the union movement, the radical 30s union movement that Guthrie was part of, was still going on, and there was no sign of it. And he wrote, where is our party, where all members held equal and vow to infiltrate that thought among the people it hopes to serve and sets a respected road for all those like me who cry, I am ragingly against absolutely everything that wants to force nature to be unnatural. He has heard 1913 Massacre already. I think, if you're all right, Heim, if you could play a couple of verses of that before you start Song to Woody, just so people hear where it came from. I can do that. Great. This is a song that um, 1913 Massacre, Woody wrote during World War II. It's a great song. We're not going to do it all tonight, though Heim begged me. I love it. It's the song, you know, I, I was listening to Woody Guthrie. Is more than one person allowed to speak? Maybe they've had enough. Yes. I, I, I was listening to Woody Guthrie uh, uh, just in, kind of in preparation for this evening. And listening to Woody Guthrie sing this song moved this heartless, cruel man <laughs> to tears. And, you know, there's a special poignancy. Uh, Woody Guthrie's life was dominated by fire. Uh, it, it, not only the fire, as you mentioned, but his daughter Kathy was consumed by fire. It's 73 children in this song. Uh, it's a story of 73 children who die because people who are strike breakers lock a door, they scream fire, and in the crush, children are dead. So, so it's fire, 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 fire. Play a couple verses in Anaheim. I like this playing while you sing, it's kind of professional, isn't it? Maybe you are. Yeah. Take a trip with me in 1913. The cab, let me put this up a bit, I'm sorry. Take a trip with me in 1913. The Calumet, Michigan, in the Copper Country. I'll take you to a place called Italian Hall, where the miners are having their big Christmas ball. I'll take you to a door and up a high stairs. Singing and dancing is heard everywhere. I'll let you shake hands with the people you see and watch the kids dance round a big Christmas tree. Here's Bob. I'm out here a thousand miles from my home. Walking a road other men have gone down. I'm seeing a new world of people and things. Here are paupers and peasants and 
princes and kings. Hey, hey, Woody Guthrie, I wrote you a song. About a funny old world that's coming along. It's sick and it's hungry, it's tired and it's torn. It looks like it's dying, it's hardly been born. Hey, hey, Woody Guthrie, but I know that you know all the things that I'm saying and many times more. I'm singing you this song, but I can't sing enough. Because there's not many men done the things that you've done. Here's to Cisco and Sonny and Lead Billy, too. And to all the good people that traveled with you. Here's to the hearts and the hands of the men that come with the dust and are gone with the wind. I'm leaving tomorrow, but I could leave today. Somewhere down the road someday, the very last thing that I say I've been hitting some hard traveling too. <laughs> so Bob Dylan is 19 when he writes that, about all this hard traveling. Um, and let's leave him there. He's been in New York City three weeks when he writes that song. Um, met Woody Guthrie, realizes he, his idol's gone. Let's go back to Woody Guthrie, who we left at about, what did I say, 23 or something, having written so long it's good to know you. He can't support his family between his band and his fortune telling and all that. And he goes out to the mecca for hillbilly music which was quickly turning into country music, which was Los Angeles. And he has a, um, I'm just gonna say, you know, in, the, in his autobiography, he's riding a freight and it's very dramatic. I, you know, I think, he, again, it's a little like Bob going to New York. He went to see his aunt and his aunt got him a job with his cousin, which is fine, it's what we all do. It's just, it doesn't fit with the <laughs> whole Woody Guthrie thing. His cousin was a singer. Um, and, 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 a, and the singing that was going on was the singing cowboy at the time. What Gene, Gene Autry had just made it, and Roy Rogers was um, coming up. So that Woody Guthrie, Jack Guthrie, his cousin, and Woody decided they would go on the radio and become singing cowboys, um, which, he, which he did not great. Um, one of the, by that point, California was full of Okies whose farms had been ruined by the dust bowls and everything. And um, he was not, he didn't sound like the smooth Gene Autry that he was supposed to. What did happen when he was there was he ran into communism. Uh, and he tells many different stories about this, but part of it is he went out to research uh, the Okies, who were his brothers and sisters, and how they were faring. And he discovered the communists were doing the best organizing, as far as you could tell, with migrant workers. And he, t he tells at least two, maybe three different stories of how he became a communist. But one of them is that he, um, one of them is he's on a freight train freezing and it suddenly all comes to him. Um, this one seems to me a little more believable, but mm, I'll read you it. It wasn't the instantaneous revelation of the freezing freight it wasn't even the slightly more gradual version he told elsewhere. In that one, he's passing by a bookstore in Sacramento in 1936. The trouble with the story is he wasn't in California in 1936. Details. In the window, he sees a thin volume with the words Constitution and Union in the title. He buys it, only to discover that it's not the Constitution of the United States, but of the Soviet Union. As he glances through, he finds that the Soviets guarantee in his words, Woody's words, Women folk and men folk are the same. 
and get the same pay for doing the same work. Color of your skin can't keep you from working and voting. Every smokestack and boiler belongs to the work hands. Nobody hanging around the streets out of work. Communism looks really good in the mid-30s when nobody has a job. And Woody is convinced by it and becomes a firm believer and starts playing mostly communist rallies and, and organizing with a friend called Will Gear. Will Gear ended up being Grandpa Walton, for those of you who remember. Uh, he was quite a radical in his time. Uh, and they play around a bunch, and finally when, where are we, 37, 38, when Stalin and the Russians invade Poland, Woody gets on the air, he's got a radio program, and says, this is a great idea. Stalin is giving the farms back to the farmers. And the station manager says, you're out here. I can take only so much. I'm not, I'm not going to listen to this crap. <laughs> he gets fired. He goes back to Pampa, Texas, and there's nothing to do in Pampa, Texas. He works in a drugstore for a while. And Will Gear, who's in New York, who's an actor, says, why don't you come to New York City? So Woody Guthrie, who doesn't like hitchhiking or hopping freight very much, gets in his car and starts to drive, but his car breaks down, and he has to sell it. And he ends up hitchhiking, and it's freezing cold in western Pennsylvania. And he finally, some people give him enough money to get a bus, and he arrives in New York City, and he gets greeted as the next Joe Hill, who was a singer from the 30s. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill is about him, uh, a radical singer. And he meets a circle of people that Will Gear knows, including Alan Lomax, the folk collector, and somebody called Peter Seeger, because he wasn't a man of the people yet, he was Peter still. Um, and I don't mean to be making fun of it like they were ridiculous, just that the story kept changing, which interests me. Um, and Lomax says to him, you're a folk singer. And Woody Guthrie goes, what would that be exactly? And, and he goes, you know, one person who sings folk songs. And he goes, what are those? And he goes, well, you might call them hillbilly songs. And he goes, yeah, I'm a hillbilly singer. But he quickly learns that in communist circles, you're a folk singer, which is a sort of Russian concept of the people's voice being heard. Um, he, he plays for commies. He, before, I'm, I'm jumping one step. So he's come from California through this circuitous route to Texas and taken the bus and done all that. He gets to New York, decides he needs to write a song to answer God Bless America, which he's been hearing every fucking day on the radio as he came over, with Kate Smith singing, you know, God, that big voice, right? bless America, that voice. And he writes a song called God Blessed America, uh, whose chorus goes, this land is your land. Uh, and it starts from the you guys can quote this better than me, from the Redwood Forest to the New York Island, and he's just made that trip, right? So he says this land is, it's a communist idea, if I may say so, this land is your land, um, and he, he decides he's gonna be the personification of that. The song goes nowhere for the moment. He eventually changes the title to this land is your land. It does fairly well for him, but actually after he gets sick, so he isn't even aware that it does well. Um, but he plays benefits, and he, he starts to have a reputation, a quick success. He does a Library of Congress interview with Lomax, if you've ever heard, is great. It's like three LPs, back when we had LPs long. Uh, he does Dust Bowl ballads, which are uh, Pastures of Plenty, and the songs that you probably know Woody Guthrie, if you know him at all. Um, and he's a sensation, and he, uh, New York says, how can I sell that? Uh, and, he, and he gets a job, he gets a bunch of jobs like this, but he gets a job as a cracker, as a hillbilly on a, radio, a national radio show called Pipe Smoking Time, which is sponsored by a tobacco company. And the story Woody Guthrie tells is, I, you know, I did it for a little while, and then I realized I was selling out, and I left. Yeah. He takes so long it's good to know you and rewrites it so it's a jingle for the company. I mean, that's how committed he is to the idea. And it pays better than anything he's ever had. But it's true that after four or five shows, having gotten his wife out from Texas and is now three kids, he quits because he can't work for this system. I mean, this, I don't know about you guys, this rings a bell to me about coming to New York. 
is you go, I got this dream, I'm not going to sell it, I'm not going to sell it, okay, I'll sell a little part of it, and then you kind of go, where have I ended up here? How compromised am I? Uh, and he decided he just couldn't handle it, and he quit, and he had enough money to buy a car, and he drove west again, uh, having given up on everything. Um, and I'm going to just real quickly mm, sketch the rest of his history, which is he goes to the Grand Coulee Dam, you know may, some of those songs maybe, he gets a call from now Pete Seeger saying, I've started this band called the Almanacs. Do you want to be in it? He comes back. It's a political group that's, that's uh, anti-war and maybe pro-Roosevelt. They're not clear yet. It depends what the party says. Seeger and Guthrie both said, whatever the party told us, we did about this, our political views. Um, he makes a little money. He never again really gets a chance to sell out until Pete Seeger starts a group called the Weavers, which you may have heard of, which was quite a famous um, folk group in the early 50s. And he again writes So Long It's Good to Know You, this time to make it sort of milder. I think the, you know, the, the preacher taking up collection and uh, all that is taken out because that's a little controversial. He smooths it over. Um, and he starts making some money and a song he'd written earlier becomes a hit. And it's his, bro his cousin Jack, who he's playing cowboy music with, makes this into a hit. And it's a song of a weird kind of nostalgia to me. It's about his youth in Oklahoma, except the story I just told you about his mother going crazy and his father being burned doesn't show up in this song. It's a Gene Autry kind of song, um, but it sells. Uh, and Haim's going to play it for you. Sure. A month has come and gone since I wandered from my home in those Oklahoma hills where I was born. Many a page of life has turned, many a lesson I have learned, but I feel like in those hills I still belong. Way down yonder in the Indian nation, riding my pony on the reservation in those Oklahoma hills where I was born. Now we a cowboy's life is my occupation in the Oklahoma hills where I was born. <sighs> but as I sit here today, Many miles I am away from a place I rode my pony through the dawn. While the oak and blackjack trees kiss the playful prairie breeze in those Oklahoma hills where I was born. Way down yonder in the Indian nation, riding my pony on the reservation in those Oklahoma hills where I was born. Way down yonder in the Indian nation, the cowboy's life is my occupation. Oklahoma hills where I was born Now as I turn life a page To the land of the great Osage In those Oklahoma hills where I was born While the black oil rolls and flows And the snow white cotton grows In those Oklahoma hills Oklahoma Hills, where a cowboy occupation was never his life, but it worked for him. And, you know, Guthrie really thought he was going to, I think he thought he might have a career. He got a contract with Decca Records, which is who put out the Weavers. Um, and then what happened was the Red, what we euphemistically call the Red Scare, um, which was the end of the Communist Party, the McCarthy era. Um, Pete Seeger, as you may know, you know, couldn't work for a long time. A lot of them couldn't. 
Uh, you were faced with either talking to a committee and naming names or not. Burl Ives, for example, cooperated with the committee and Guthrie famously said, it's a wonder he can still play guitar crawling on his belly like that. <laughs> um, so he, two things happened to him at the same time. One was that um, the Red Scare happened and also that his Huntington's got so bad that he ended up in a hospital. And he would joke with Seeger and Lomax when they showed up, he said, you know, this is the only safe place in America anymore, here in the insane asylum. Um, you know, when I say that the FBI is chasing after me, they just say I'm crazy. Um, so he gets sicker and sicker, and come we get back to 1960 when the 19-year-old Bob Dylan shows up and goes, I'm going to play you Woody Guthrie songs. After that, Dylan in New York is, realizes that he's can't be Woody Guthrie, and his success is as quick in its way as um, Woody's was. He gets um, within, I think, a year and a half, so his father gave him a year, remember, to try to make it in the big city. Within a year or so, he gets reviewed by the New York Times, he gets signed by Columbia Records and John Hammond to produce his record, and he then plays Carnegie Hall. Um, the record is a very, if you know Bob Dylan's first album, it's a very interesting, strange piece of work. Um, it's almost all about death, this now 20-year-old, and it, much of it is blues that he sings as if he was a Delta black guy. Uh, so instead of being Woody Guthrie, he turns into that person. Um, very quickly, he, when New York says, how can we sell that, this first record doesn't sell, he gets a manager called Albert Grossman, and the market right then was for something that was then called protest songs or topical songs. And he writes a song which I've always thought was kind of calculated and constructed to be a hit called Blown in the Wind, which opens his second record. And uh, it, it's based on an old uh, black spiritual uh, auction block. Um, and it, it makes him because Albert Grossman has started a group that he's made up. Do you guys, you maybe don't, remember the monkeys who were sort of created to be the Beatles? Well, Albert Grossman decides he needs to uh, start a group that will be the Weavers because the Weavers have now been blacklisted. So he gets a stand-up comedian, a folk singer, and a girl who kind of hangs around folk clubs and calls them Peter, Paul, and Mary. Makes a band out of them and then gives them blowing in the wind because that's his other client, Bob Dylan, and they have a big hit with it, and he's suddenly a famous songwriter. Um, he wants to be a famous performer as well, though, not just a songwriter. And he starts to avoid um, topical songs. He does them for a couple records, and then I think he feels like it limits him. There's a, did I write down where the quote is? There's a quote where he sort of breaks, he's, you know, he sang at the March on Washington. Um, uh, he uh, did benefits for SNCC. He went down to Mississippi and sang for them. But by the end, he was, um, I don't think I have it here. I, didn't, I don't think I marked it. But by the end, by the end, meaning by 1963 or four, by the Selma March, he'd kind of turned against it. And he wanted to write personal songs. Um, Again, I think it's a mix of wanting to do what he really wanted to do, having his dream fulfilled, and something that had some more commercial value. So he wrote this next song that Haim's going to sing that is, um, I think, actually a very strange song. It's a nostalgic song the way the Oklahoma Hills is. But it ha if you'll notice at the end, it turns into a sort of prayer. I'm not sure I totally understand it. But it's the North Country. It's Hibbing. It's all I've given up to be in New York City, I kind of miss, even though, you know, he will soon be convinced that New York City is the heart of everything. This song has a nostalgic feel to it. If you're traveling in the North Country Fair, where the winds hit heavy on the borderline, Remember me to one who lives there. She once was a true love of mine. An 
And if you go in the snowflake storm, when the rivers freeze and summer ends, please see if she's wearing a coat so warm to keep her from the howling winds. Please see that her hair hangs long, it rolls and flows all down her breast. Please see for me that her hair hangs long, that's the way I remember it best. Traveling in the North Country Fair, where the winds hit heavy on the borderline. Remember me to one who lives there. She once was a true love of mine. So Guthrie, I'm, I'm getting towards the end here, and then we'll talk some. Um, you know, Guthrie raised three kids in New York, lived out in Coney Island. New York became his base and his home. Um, he didn't have much success in his life. He, he got sick, um, you know, fairly young. I think he was in his, yeah, from 43 he got sick, and he died at age 55. So he was from 43 to 55, so he didn't have a long career. And he got here in his 30s. Um, but it was remarkable. Uh, and Dylan, as you know, stayed around New York for a while and, and has come back periodically. And certainly in his song there, I was thinking there's that song, Just Like Tom Thumb's Blues, that begins when you're down in the rain in Juarez, which is a song, I think, a bunch about drugs. And uh, at the end of it, you can quote it better than I, and he says, I'm going back to New York City. I do think I've had enough. You know, New York City is and it was the inspiration for a lot of those songs, I think. And um, the tradition that the two of them made um, is, to me, a really important one. And it's partly a tradition of how you keep that hope alive, how you have that vision and work in a system that wants to sell whatever you make or something, but how you maintain some kind of integrity uh, and make some good art in the process. I think the tradition continues with Heim and Cam Brown. Um, I've asked him to sing a song of his, which I'm going to introduce because he tells me it gets misunderstood a bunch. Um, and I have a very strong understanding about it, which may be I get misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a song called Brooklyn 55. Right? Yeah. Brooklyn 55, which I think is a song about the trap of nostalgia, about how you get to the city from wherever we all came from and you become loyal in a way that maybe clouds your vision in some way. I think it's a great song. He's going to sing it for you. But it, uh, and and uh, uh, if, if you want to know my view of the song, yeah. of course you can ask him later. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, but, but let me tell you now, I, 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 I didn't grow up in Brooklyn. I don't know. I had nothing. I cheered for the Dodgers when I was a kid and go to games up in Old Emmett's Field with my old man to take me and maybe a friend of his I can along just to spend a few hours in the cold April sun with a couple of beers and a three-fingered glove in case that you get one our way Say hey if you want or talk about me
know, hmm. he's kind of telling you what he actually thinks. He's not putting you on, I don't think. Um, so, you know, I don't know specifically if Dave Van Rock was a problem. I know they had a fight over that song, but I think they ended up friends in some way. Yes, sir. Can you explain to us what grown up anger is? Says the editor of my book. <laughs>
I'm sorry, fifth anniversary. I lose track of time. When you get angry. When I get angry. But at, at that point, I, I looked at these children's faces the other night on television as they came forward at me, and I felt profoundly uh, sad and angry at the same time at this loss of, of, in, of the innocent. And it's a wonderful page, right there. Thanks, and Daniel wrote a wonderful essay about this particular painting around the corner, and, and I think you pegged it without ever seeing the actual painting. Yeah, right, you know, I, I, thought, I worked off the photo. <laughs> that, that was quite remote, and I thought you did a great job. But yeah, that it's is. It's in this catalog. It is in the catalog. There's available right there. There's a nice catalog. There's books available here at Howell. As, and, and I think, I'd just like to say too that I think that uh, as anger and as an emotion and, and the idea of art, music, literature can carry the struggle forward from the past to the present as a vehicle to uh, bolster ourselves against fear or the, or the, the perception of fear. And, and I think, again, we're here now. So uh, that, that's really, again, a part of what I was thinking. Thanks, sir. Other questions? We're good? Great. Thank you all for coming. I want a special hand for Hein. Thank you.